Hello and welcome back to the Anxiety Book Club. This is episode number 52. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Stephen Porges, author of this month's book, Our Polyvagal World, How Safety and Trauma Can Change Us. Stephen is a scientist, professor of psychology, and the originator of the theory we'll be talking about today, the polyvagal theory. So Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Well, Joshua, thank you for inviting me. Totally. We were just getting to know each other a little bit. Apparently, we um, have both spent some time in the D.C. area and also have a Florida connection, so that's nice. Um, And I know you wrote this book. I think you wrote this book with your son, but most of the time when you say I and then in parentheses you say Stephen, it's your (laughs) name there. So he's probably in here somewhere, I'm guessing. Well, he's really uh, he's really the voice of the book, and I'm really the source of the book. So it's a really, uh, I would say, a beautiful collaboration. You know, Seth is actually a uh, he started off as a journalist, so he's a he knows how to communicate, and he's a movie maker now. And uh, my my issue is I create complex ideas, and he simplifies it. And so the beauty of working with him was really this whole pleasure of creating a vehicle to communicate complex ideas in basically everyday language. Nice. That sounds like a really beautiful partnership. Uh, So I've been looking all over my body for the last few weeks for this vagus nerve, and I haven't quite found it. Can you tell me where where it is? Well, that's an interesting strategy. See, I I would never have thought of that. I would be basically more interested in the organs that it's connected to, Mm. so like the heart and the gut. Uh, or even like your voice. Uh, and the, the issue is that it's a nerve that really uh, connects the brain to the visceral organs of the body. So when people talk about brain-body or mind-body relationships, they can't talk about it without really having a deeper understanding of the vagus, which is primarily your surveillance system connecting your organs to the brain Yet, most people don't think of the sensory part of the vagus, the surveillance system. They think about the motor part. They think of how they can literally hack the vagus to calm their body down. So there's a lot of misinterpretations out there about how the whole system works. Mm. Well, hopefully we can clear up some of that here today. We'll try. Yeah. So just starting with the basics, because I'm I'm not so anatomically inclined what what is a nerve? <laughs> a nerve is literally a a fiber. We have to think of it. Let's play with metaphors. A nerve literally is a wire, and uh, so a a nerve like the vagus is a complex cable, literally, because it has different types of fibers in it. It's more like a cable. So it's connecting the brain to the body. And it's one of the major uh, cranial nerves. In fact, it's the largest nerve in the body because it goes from the brainstem to virtually every organ inside your body. And it's loaded. I mean, most of the fibers, most of the little wires inside that larger cable are sensory wires. They're really monitoring the status of different organs like your stomach, uh, like your heart, you know, and even organs like you don't think too much about, you know, the pancreas and, you know, your kidneys, uh, and and even picking up information from lower parts of your body, your genitalia. And so it is really a, picking up the status of how your body is functioning, sending that information to the brainstem, and then the brainstem sends signals back down to optimize and regulate those organs. That's the, I would say, that's the optimal story of how the nerve is involved in the regulation of bodily organs. But that optimistic or, let's say, idealistic organizational pattern is disrupted. It's disrupted by thoughts when we feel stressed, scared, or uh, I think the title of your podcast, the word is anxiety embedded in it. Is that Mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is anxiety? And anxiety is when a bunch of signals are coming down, disrupting those brainstem areas that regulate homeostatic function within our body, basically utilizing the vagus to optimize homeostatic function, which is health, growth, and restoration. So anxiety, even though it's a psychological construct, is operationally more linked to the vagus than it is to mental thoughts. It's really saying my vagus is disrupted from serving homeostatic function. It's really now uh, giving permission 
to my uh, physiology to really be in a state of fight or flight, to be defensive, to be aggressive, to basically mobilize and get out of there. Hmm. So does that mean that um, absent someone's report of their psychological state of being or feeling anxious, is there a way to kind of use some kind of instruments to just look at someone's vagus nerve or system and say, ah, this person is feeling anxiety right now? Yeah, I I would really reframe it and say, yes, we can use uh, 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 measurements. Uh, we can create objective measurements of physiological state. We can determine whether the physiology is supporting health, growth, and restoration, or what's called homeostatic functions, or is the physiology locked into a state of defense or threat? And if it's locked into a state of threat, then that lower part of the brain is a fertile uh, platform for psychological experiences related to stress and anxiety, uh, obsessiveness, uh, perseveration. You know, the mind will just start going all off because the body is not in a safe state. But if the physiology is now more homeostatic, more rhythmic, more supporting the body's organs, then the higher brain structures are literally given permission to have a different set of experiences. Experiences of feeling safe, of being optimistic, to being exploratory, to be creative. I, I think we're locked into our psychological world, our language and our thoughts, which is trying to make sense out of these very primitive physiological feelings. And so we start coming up like the term anxiety. And we think we can literally treat anxiety, usually by taking away the things that we believe are creating the anxiety. But I think that is an inefficient strategy because you take the things away and many people who suffer from severe anxiety will find something else to be anxious about mm -hmm. because the body is in a physiological state of threat. And now the intentional brain, this higher brain structure, are trying to make sense of those feelings. And so what polyvagal theory gets into is saying there's really some very basic core physiological states that are really below the levels of the psychological constructs. And when those states shift, we start looking or creating uh, meaning out of those feelings. And that meaning becomes anxiety, stress. We, you know, we, we have a lot of good ones. We come up with it, literally run our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm often challenging my mother who says things like, well, if I just won the lottery, then I wouldn't worry anymore. And then I look, I look at her and I say, are you sure? And she, she feels quite sure about it, but I think she's just predisposed to worry. Yeah, well, that is, you know, I, I listen, first of all, I would, I would place money on your explanation or your bias. Um, it doesn't work that way. We can look at the wealthiest people in the world and ask the question, are these people, do they, are they satisfied? Are they happy? And the answer is probably not. So it's not like, in fact, there's some, there's research on the amount of money people make and how happy they are. And apparently it's linear. You're happier uh, when you make more money up to literally not too much. Uh, the turning point is like a little over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And then the more money that people make, the less happy they are. It's very, it's a very strange uh, picture of what life is about. Because we think if we only had those resources, those resources meaning money or wealth or status, or security, that security would enable us to express ourselves in the most optimistic and happy ways. But it's not really how the world is. Hmm. So maybe let's set a little context. I realize we kind of rushed out of the gates here. So polyvagal theory, which is something that you originated has kind of taken the world of mental health by storm in the last several years. Do you want to just speak a little bit about the theory more broadly and kind of the place yeah, that it has? I, I will, I'll talk about it broadly, but we have to be careful because the terms, that's why it's not having Seth in the room. That's my son who, who is a great communicator. May make it, you know, I may make things too dense. So you make sure to get clarification. Let's start off by really saying, what does polyvagal theory bring to the table? It, it tells us that our physiological state 
determines in part how we experience the world. Now, what does that mean? It means if our heart rates are too are fast, we tend to be in a state of uh, defensiveness and we're biased towards negativity. When our heart rate and our breathing is calm and relaxed, uh, we're more flexible. We see the world in a more positive way. Now, underneath those major uh, changes that I described is this character, the vagus. So when the vagus is doing its job in calming us down, supporting homeostatic function, our bodies heal and grow. Uh, but when the vagus gets retracted, which it does for many reasons, sometimes when we're just kind of like walking up a flight of steps, uh, when we need more metabolic output, or when we're playing, and we you know again also need more meta metabolic output, there's nothing wrong with, in a sense, turning or downregulating the vagus, the issue is, will it pop back in and calm us down when we no longer need that metabolic resource? And that's kind of like the flexibility of this vagal circuit. And that underlies our, literally, our biobehavioral flexibility to the challenges of life. And in a way, polyvagal theory says, before you start creating your narrative, explaining uh, why you are who you are, think about those underlying bodily feelings. Can you even describe them? Uh, once you start becoming aware of them, you realize that if your heart is uh, basically beating real heavily and uh, you're not going to be a, a very engaged, compassionate listener to someone else. But if you're calm in your own body, you can be accessible to others and welcoming to them. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know in uh, training for certain therapeutic modalities, they really emphasize the centeredness and groundedness mm -hmm. of the clinician. Um, even during a session where they might be feeling triggered by something, a client says to take some time to, um, you know, get back yeah. into this zone of being able to be present. See, I, I would think that virtually all forms of effective therapy are intuitively polyvagal informed. I'm not saying they acknowledge it, nor do they need to. The issue is that they're very, in a sense, understanding of the state that the individual is in. Now, remember the world we're in, this uh, Western world says, I don't really care how you feel. It's your behavior I'm concerned about. So you perform, you do this, and says, we learn within our culture to basically numb out our feelings, not to experience them. Now, in polyvagal terminology, when your bodily body is numb, you're turning off the feedback of your bodily organs to your brain, and that disrupts the homeostatic functions of healing, health, growth, and restoration, both mental and physical health. So your interest in mental health and the journey that you're on you realize that a lot of people have experienced adversity and there's a common consequence of that is they become numb to their own bodily feelings. Now that's a very powerful, a very important adaptive reaction, but it has consequence. That numbing of that feedback loop uh, leads to uh, difficulties in expressing certain types of feelings towards others, but from a polyvagal perspective, it also leads to a disruption in the body's own ability to heal itself because we have to, it's a feedback loop. We have to feel the system has to send information to the brain. The brain has to interpret it and it has to come back down. So polyvagal theory basically emphasizes that the awareness of bodily feelings is really the beginning of therapy. Mm hmm yeah, so I, I remember reading in the book about uh, this case of people who had COVID and those who performed much worse when they had experiences of adversity or lived in a sort of stressful climate. What is what is the mechanism of action there? Is, is it mm -hmm. something like there's not enough resources to both be on alert and heal ourselves simultaneously, or is it more complicated than that? Well, you can start with the Star Trek analogy. What are you going to use your resources for, energy fields or uh, uh, other resources? So in a sense, uh, you're, you're right. We're using our resources for defense 
not allowing the body to recover. Now, that being said, we are very efficient organisms in being defensive. And that's fine as long as we have sufficient time to feel safe enough not to be defensive to allow these homeostatic functions to come back on board. Mm -hmm. Is it understood, though, what exactly is happening in the body of a chronically anxious person that's keeping them from healing as quickly as someone who's more homeostatic? Well, more let's, let's start off with what you introduced, and that was what happened during COVID. And in the research that we conducted, we basically used survey tools and uh, for several thousand people and asked them some really basic questions. So, of course, what was their adversity history? Did they have trauma in their past? Medical trauma, mental trauma, physical traumas. And the second thing was, what was their subjective description of their own autonomic nervous system? Was their own autonomic nervous system supporting health growth and restoration? Or was it more locked into a physiological state of threat? Now, the interesting thing, let's start off with what happened in the study, uh, which occurred during the spring of 2020 when the pandemic just started. And our first study, we did we reported only people who experienced the pandemic without getting infected. And on, of those people, what was a very interesting mapping was the... Uh, a pathway from adversity history and whether they were depressed or anxious or worried during the pandemic. So if they had more adversity, they had more of these, let's say, mental health symptoms. But that was literally a significant pathway, but very weak compared to a pathway that said, if you had adversity and your autonomic nervous system is now tuned to be locked into a state of defense, then your outcomes, your mental health outcomes during the pandemic are going to be quite poor. Okay. You follow what I'm saying? It's not merely the event. And this is very a polyvagal, let's do polyvagal jargon. It's not the event. It's the body's reaction to the event. So adversity in itself is an event. But if the body autonomically recovers from that, it has great resilience and the person is quite buffered. But if the person has adversity and the consequence is their autonomic nervous system is now locked into a state of defense, then the outcomes aren't good. Outcomes related to like uh, well-being under the coronavirus or? Uh, I would say outcomes in many dimensions. Uh -huh. Okay. In this study, it was really mental health features mm. during, the, during COVID. Now, of the 2,000 people we surveyed, uh, we actually, a hundred of them had had COVID and they were not in the first uh, analysis. Now that hundred people who got it in the first wave, we're talking like March and April of 2020, 75% of those people had high adversity scores. So, and if they had low, none of those people got COVID initially. So the part that I want you to think about is not that adversity history is causal for getting COVID. But early on during COVID, the people who got it during the first wave, the most susceptible ones, were those who had severe adversity and autonomic, uh, uh, basic autonomic states that were locked into a state of defense. Mm -hmm. Now, by the time the pandemic ended, so many people got COVID because the virus found the people, but the initial one was that we can literally talk about a vulnerability. And interestingly, the medical community started to talk about a vulnerability, and they were saying, really, there are pre-existing conditions. But what did they mean by that? They meant obesity and diabetes. But the most powerful one, from my perspective, is really adversity history. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting and alarming um, just to think how dangerous these situations of uh, mental health adversity can be impacting people's physical health. Uh, yes, Josh, this is the important point. Again, we live in a culture that says, you know, mental health is kind of an optional thing. If you don't want to be mentally, don't mentally ill, 
don't be mentally ill, but physical illness, we kind of accept that as this very objective and uh, almost uh, almost by, you know, you can't get out of it. You have to be healed by an external source, a physician, a medication, a procedure. What polyvagal theory says that when a body's in a state of threat, its defensive systems affect not just physical health, but mental health as well. There is no distinction between mental health and physical health. And this has been a real great problem in the treatment of mental health, where people have been really treated as if there was nothing wrong with them because there was no marker within any of their, uh, let's say, visceral organs. Mm. Does polyvagal theory permit us to have something quantifiable that would be seen as compelling to these more traditionally minded uh, folks in the medical communities? Uh, it basically gives uh, a script that would lead to that. But here is the basic problem. Um, when we deal with medicine, approximately 50 to 70 percent of the people with symptoms do not have any, quote, organic uh, confirmation, meaning the types of assessments that are used for confirming diagnosis are not merely symptoms. They're looking for some other assessment. It could be, uh, uh, you know, an x-ray. It could be a a blood assay. It could be a genetic. It it could be tissue, but it's really uh, kind of look at the end organs function. Now, what's missing in the medical perspective is the neural regulation of the end organs. So many of these disorders are basically now called functional disorders or medically unexplained symptoms. They are effects on the organ. People report the symptoms. The issue is the traditional assessment procedures are not detecting it. Now, polyvagal theory says they don't detect it because they're really measuring the wrong variables. What they need to do is develop measures of the neural regulation of the end organ. And medicine is very far behind on that level. So the model is that your neural regulation of the end organ is gets disrupted when the body shifts into threat reactions. That occurs long before the end organ is damaged. So medicine is very focused on end organ damage, mm-hmm. not on neural regulation of the end organ. And this has resulted in a limitation of the variables or the metrics that can be used to measure these dynamic changes in the regulation of the organs. Mm. So what kind of like functional disorders or maladies are we thinking about here? Irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, migraines. I mean, those are, you know, some of the top that come come to mind. The whole class of disorders that are known as dysautonomia, most of those don't have any specific uh, diagnostic, organic diagnostic uh, measure, yet they are symptoms that are disrupted to these people's lives. We have people with long COVID. Uh, We have people with Lyme's disease uh, or Epstein's bar, chronic fatigue, where people have gotten a label, but the label doesn't really give them a metric of showing how the nervous system has been uh, dysregulated and or in a, uh, a hint of how to uh, uh, rehabilitate that nervous system. Uh, okay, so I think I have it. So there's like a class of uh, maladies or things that affect people for which the symptoms are very obvious to them, but for which traditional medicine doesn't have like uh, a standard procedure for looking inside the body and confirming people's symptoms? Well, it has standard procedures. They just don't map into the system, uh, the symptom cluster. There is this, uh, the history of medicine was always based upon symptoms or symptom clusters with the uh, inferred expectation that underneath the symptom cluster was an organic cause. That has not proven to be true. It's an assumption. So when they can't find an organic, meaning damage to the organ, the patient is often dismissed as say they told, basically, it's all in your head. Mm-hmm. Go see a psychiatrist. Go see a psychologist. It's not an appreciation that their body, body's organs are reacting through neural pathways 
uh, that can be reorganized as and interpreted as the body's in a chronic state of threat. And what, let's say, the world you're entering in, you would say, well, maybe they're just highly anxious. Well, from my world, people who are highly anxious, their physiology is in a state of chronic threat. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you talk about these different um, states or systems, this metaphor of the red, the green, and the yellow, and some of the physical manifestations of occupying one or another one of those states was really interesting to me that I hadn't known before. I'm talking about um, facial affect going flat or these small, small bones in our ears um, going up or down. Um, can you speak a little bit about these? Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is because we think of facial expressivities. We don't realize that our face is literally uh, an organ that's broadcasting our physiological state. And that is because in our own evolution, our own development, the uh, neurons, the nerves that regulate our heart uh, come from an area in the brain that regulates our face. So our facial expressivity is linked to the vagal regulation of our heart. Um, Our facial, so when we have lots of affect, it really, ref- positive affect, it reflects the fact that our vagus is basically calming or helping organize our physiological state. Uh, when we're in that state, the nerves regulating the middle ear muscles, which enable us to extract human voice from background sound. When we're in this positive state, they work fine and they dampen out low frequency sounds and we can process language. We can hear people speaking in loud environments, including bars. But when our bodies go into a state of threat, we only hear the sounds out around us. Like if we're walking down the street in a strange town, talking to someone, and we basically get destabilized because it looks like we're in the wrong place, we got lost. We have difficulty understanding what someone's saying to us but we do extraordinarily well detecting the footsteps behind us. So Mm -hmm. these become very powerful uh, neural mechanisms that that we adapt, that have been adapted to enhance our own survival. So can I see these on people? Can I see their middle ear muscles toggling them out? You can see their face. And so the, the part is, yeah, you can see a branch a branch of the facial nerve that regulates this major muscle in the middle ear that is called that muscle is called the stapedius. It's uh, regulated by a branch of the facial nerve. And that branch of the facial nerve really is also, or something connected to it, goes to the muscle around the eye, that orbital muscle where you see exuberance in people's faces. It's called the obiculus oculi. So when people see this kind of like exuberance in the upper part of the face, and they often interpret that they're making contact with the other person, uh, it's, they are. The middle person's middle ears are contracting, and they are listening to every word that person is saying. But if that upper part of the face is flat, uh, they may be did not detecting the actual uh, articulated words, but really detecting background noises or sounds. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. What I wanted to really say is that um, the good therapists in the world intuitively know this. They really check the state of their clients by looking at the client's face, by looking at the upper part of the face, by listening to the intonation of the client's voice. Likewise, when you have this more vagal regulation or calming, your voice is more melodic. And that's because the laryngeal and pharyngeal nerves that control intonation are also vagal nerves. And this is the interesting evolutionary journey of social mammals. And that is the area of the brainstem that regulate the vagus or common cranial nerve uh, migrate eventually to an area of the brainstem that control the, the nerves of the muscles of the face and head. So our face and head became this literally tool to broadcast our physiological state. And that's how people feel safe with each other or how you feel safe. Or let's say if you have a pet, how does a pet determine 
that a human is safe to come close to. And what you also will realize that many people talk to their pets like they're talking to infants. Mm -hmm. And the modulated frequencies of talking to an infant or a pet is actually a triggering a, a template for a script that the body of these pets, as well as infants, preverbal infants, detect as signals of safety. And even adults detect those signals of safety. A more modulated voice uh, basically triggers us to be calmer and engaged. Mm. Yeah, I noticed in the book you were talking about the way that people talk to their dogs and they'll say, like, who's a good boy in this kind of sing-songy way? And I yeah. realize that no one goes up to their dog and just asks them, who <laughs> is a good boy? <laughs> also, when they say, when they use words like, bad boy the the frequency goes down and when they're trying to scold their dogs the dog understands the intonation of the voice and really goes down towards the ground um mm -hmm. so it's the intonation it's the vocabulary is it okay so we think in our culture that it's the uh the narrative is based on the language but truly our social communication is not solely language-based. It's based upon the intonation of her voice in social communication. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard the one about the dog that went to the therapist. <laughs> no, but I'm willing to listen. Yeah, he was complaining. He said, it's, it's always good dog, good dog, but never great dog. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I think it's easier. I think the uh, prosodic uh, articulation of good dog is more soothing than great dog, mm -hmm. I think, because the great dog has uh, more higher frequency harmonics. So I think the melodic aspect of good dog versus great dog. <laughs> so uh, I, I think even though it's it's a cute joke, I think the dog should be happy that it's, it's good dog. Ah, yes. We'll have to write the New Yorker. I think it was a cartoon in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing you talk about in the book that I don't know a ton about is autism mm -hmm. and how that is related to what we're talking about now about hearing and hearing sensitivity and sensory stimulation. What role does this kind of theory and work have to do with autistic people? Well, f first of all, it, it, it asks a different level question. So a lot of people get the diagnosis of autism in part because of their hypersensitivities to the world they're in. And the this uh, theory says, you know, perhaps for many people who get the diagnosis for that, uh, which compromises their life because it's very unpleasant to be sensitive to the sounds that are just overwhelming, that that is really due to the body being locked to a state of threat, that if the body were calmed down, that those hypersensitivities would be dissipated. And then the other attributes that are assumed to be features of autism, they can, they can exist in a body that's not being under such stress. So if we watch many individuals with autism, they're very much overwhelmed by the sensory experience of the world they live in. So polyvagal theory says, look, a major disruptor in the world of autism is hypersensitivities. And another aspect of this is that another feature of autistic individuals is that many of them are extraordinarily anxious. So from a polyvagal perspective, it's saying their physiology is locked into a state of threat and their sensory system is tuned to detect predator. So what would happen if the body were calmed down? Would many of these features literally dissipate? And that's the perspective I take. Yeah. And I remember reading in the book that at least in some cases, it was really helpful to design spaces that were yeah. less stimulating, such that some of these formerly more taciturn or quiet um, kind of autistic folks began to speak. Yeah. Well, it, there's been some remarkable experiences. I developed an intervention called the Safe and Sound Protocol which was based on the assumption that you could create greater neural flexibility. You could exercise these systems and then the resilience would come in. And there were individuals who had these hypersensitivities and talked with a voice that lacked prosody, 
you know, a monotone. And after going through these neural exercises of listening to uh, this intervention, they were spontaneously socially engaged in other. And it was kind of a remarkable experience to observe that. And it meant to me that some people were literally locked into physiological states that were states. They weren't destined by their, quote, genetics. And I've been writing about this, that our view of autism uh, has really been a view of genetic determinism. Yet there is no good genetic model of autism. There's some genes that are weakly re related to a higher prevalence of autism, but not a strong model. Yet the physiological state of autistic individuals tends to be locked, for many, locked into a state of threat. And that's the portal of entry of, of optimizing their experience that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really compelling. And I think it, it also maps on to some of the discussion in the book about incarcerated people and just any other folks experiencing scenarios or ecosystems in which stress is at a really high level. Yeah. Well, the issues we use the word, see, the, using the word stress or anxiety um, starts making it real unto itself, separate from a nervous system that is locked into a state of defense. I think a simpler explanation is that it is really more of a, uh, let's say, recursive, being more defined by the response and not by the stimulus. So we tend to think of anxiety and stress as being caused by things external to us. Polyvagal theory says you have to start emphasizing the response and the response is inside of us. So that response that I have may not be the same response you have. So if my body gets triggered into a state of threat, my uh, repertoire behavior will rapidly change. Hmm. So I think what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that, um, you know, in, in maybe th therapeutic modalities, which have focused a lot on uh, maybe some of the stories that we, uh, we or our minds invent about anxiety or stress, um, those are those are true and, and helpful, but it's really important to look at the physical nervous system as a way to either identify or possibly even treat some of these conditions. I think you're getting close to the theme here. And that is we respect the fact that we're, we have large creative brains that try to make sense out of our own experiences. But our tendency is that our narratives are very uh, often cast us as heroic meaning or victim. And, you know, like when you had with Dick was on, you start dealing with the, the parts and the parts start to create their own narratives. Now, the issue is if we can say, yeah, that's really quite remarkable that we can create these narratives, but what are we creating the narratives of? We're creating the narratives of our bodily reactions. And can we become more aware of them and can we learn from them? And then can we learn to navigate with that knowledge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think slowly over time, as I delve deeper and deeper into all of these different modalities and tools, I'm becoming a lot more open to the possibility that there's many different uh, tools and interventions that are helpful instead of the kind of one thing um, that, you know, is the end all be all for all people. Oh, I, I think there are a lot of very insightful people. I think they develop their own language, their own strategies, and they're using their own knowledge base to create that structure. Sometimes I think it's not the fact that they're successful and, and have really uh, create useful intuitive tools. It's that there are some underlying core processes that tend not to be really emphasized, and that might simplify the journey to let's say management of uh, uh, management and optimizing human experience. Hmm. So another part of the book that I found compelling as someone who likes to play the guitar is this explanation for why singing yeah. feels good and calms us down and its relation to heart rate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, the simplest thing is there are two things going on with singing. One is on the out breath. So when you see, <clears throat> when you're singing, you're really slowing your exhalation. And physiologically, that's when the vagus has its inhibitory aspect. 
effect on the heart. That's when it's calming, doing exhalation. So when you sing, that aspect of the exhalation is calming you. But there's more to singing. There's the intonation, the laryngeal and pharyngeal nerves, the whole oral cavity is being used, and you're also listening to your voice. It's a remarkable neural exercise of the neural structures that I basically call the social engagement system. Mm -hmm. Well, I know it definitely feels good. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the vagus nerve is running quite literally from your brainstem, which I think is located somewhere near your neck. Is that right? Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's the, the smallest and the lowest part uh, of your brain and it sticks into the, uh, base of your neck. Yeah. Okay. And then there's these connections to, I, I, I don't know if it's limited. Is it literally every one of gallbladder and kidney, lungs and heart? And yeah, it's going, if you looked at a picture, uh, actually you can just Google it, uh, Vegas and connections, you'll see it going all over the place, going to virtually every organ within your body. And then you'll see that another nerve, another set of nerves are going to those organs as well. And they become uh, nerves that are known as the sympathetic nervous system. And they're coming off the spine. And the sympathetic has really been conceptualized as your accelerator, your energy source. And the vagus is really your brake. And, but it's more complicated than that. But that's the uh, original, and let's say, way of understanding it. So you... You utilize the sympathetics for, is not merely a fight flight system. It gives you energy exuberance. I mean, you really w want that sympathetic nervous system to be there, but it functions in a remarkably positive way. If that, uh, the newer part of the vagus, what I call the ventral vagal circuit, and which is related to social behavior, when that's still on board and you get sympathetics, that's play. That's, that's what we love in life, where our faces are animated and we're still mobilized. So it's not like sympathetic is bad. Sympathetic without that ventral vagus, it can become, that's how we would define stress. So the difference between playfulness and stressful behavior is literally the smile. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting how these experiences that on the face of it can seem either scary or exciting um really hinge on how we're responding to it like a roller coaster for example mm. um i don't like them that much but once i convince myself that i won't die i can enjoy them yeah. um so there's something there about knowing that safety is available even when perhaps uh, elements of your experience don't feel safe. Well, I, I use the example of ro roller coasters frequently. I say, what's the difference between going on a roller coaster and jumping out of a 10-story window? You know, viscerally, it's the same experience. But one, you have guardrails. You're protected. So now you're on a journey of exploration and experience. So you you, you know that you're safe enough to experience this very unique effect of that visceral feeling. And you have a feeling it's quite exuberant because you have a visceral feeling without the, the true impact of being injured by it. Um, yeah, it's funny in this case because oftentimes it seems like this rational brain of ours doesn't do a terrific job, especially in those with trauma, of convincing people that they're safe. And yet in this example of the roller coaster, you kind of just need to internalize this belief or trust, you know, whoever built the roller coaster mm -hmm. and the institutions that support it. And then all of a sudden you can kind of let go of this fear. Whereas in so many other cases, people will feel scared in situations they know rationally to not be dangerous, but the fear remains. Okay, so you, you brought up something that is very pertinent. People who have trauma histories, um, their intentional brain is not going to solve the problem. So they go through this rational, so that person should, is safe, but my body doesn't feel safe with them. So it's really creating this wonderful uh, human experience of a literally a competition between intentional thoughts and survival bodily reactions. 
And the survival bodily reactions are always going to be more powerful. And the reason the person with trauma can't can't accept the intentional brain's decision making is because they experienced a life threat at a point in time when they did listen to that message. So they have learned that literally uh, like a single trial learning that uh, if they, they are going to be in great danger and they're trying to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, we certainly talk about that a lot on the podcast. Um, but just to press this example a little further about the roller coaster. So like, I, statistically speaking, I'm not sure how safe or unsafe roller coasters are. I'm, I'm assuming they're very safe. Um, similarly, swimming in the ocean, you know, getting eaten by a shark if you don't live, you know, off the coast of Cape Town is also, it's a pretty minimal risk. So why, why is it the case that even though I know I'm not going to get eaten by a shark, I still feel some fear out in the ocean? Well, it's the associations that a lot of press on it. But, you know, those things do occur. Uh, the issue when you come to roller coasters, if you're dealing with roller coasters at the major amusement parks versus uh, the carnivals, there's a big difference in maintenance and injury. Mm -hmm. So you're basically trusting on roller co coasters, um, literally the branding of it. And if you, uh, because I think they potentially can be dangerous if they're not maintained. The sharks, you know, again, when you start dealing with probabilities, um, it's really quite low. Um, and, you know, living in Florida, there are certain areas where there are more shark-related uh, incidents than others. But uh, I think the bit with sharks is that it comes from underneath and it comes unexpected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we put sharks on roller coasters, that would really be a worst nightmare. <laughs> yes, that, that was good. But I'm also thinking, you know, the uh, Jaws movies didn't help the situation. Yeah, my dad told me when those came out, no one swam for, for at least a summer in Florida. Yeah. So speaking of animals, there's a story to tell here about reptiles that's illustrated in the book about how their nervous system and their capability for for playing dead or shutting down kind of informed the story that led to the creation of this mammalian yeah. um, vagal nervous system. Can you say something about that? Sure. Well, you know, uh, virtually every vertebrate from the most primitive fish to humans has a vagus, but the vagus is different in mammals. Uh, the vagus, uh, basically, I, I basically coin, uh, cast the vagus in its own let's say, evolutionary story, where it's the neurons that come from the vagus originally came from an area at the back of the brain. And, uh, and that served animals well uh, when their cortex, when their brain was small. Now, what happens with mammals, they have a large cortex and the vagus could be used as a defense system in these more primitive vertebrates because it would literally stop the heart and stop breathing. So when a reptile is under threat, it, it really stops breathing and can hold its breath uh, for a couple hours because there's no uh, risk of uh, brain damage from lack of oxygen. There's just very little there. But mammals uh, can't, uh, uh, they have to breathe. We have a very large cortex and we need oxygenated blood. So breathing oxygenates the blood and we need to move it to the cortex. So even when we pass out or dissociate or shut down, uh, we can only do that for a short period of time. I think the perfect example happens to be the small mammals of prey, like uh, mice and guinea pigs, where under threat, they literally pass out. But in the passing out, you know, you probably have seen pictures of the mouse in the jaws of a cat. And the mouse, uh, it looks like the mouse is dead. The cat drops it and the mouse wakes up and scampers away. But the mouse can't stay in that state forever, can't stay in that immobilization state. So it's time limited. The interesting part is that that immobilization uh, where the heart basically stops or goes very slow uh, and looks like they're dead is a feature of 
animals of prey, but not mammals of predator mammals. So if you put an electrode into the brainstem of an animal of prey and stimulate that dorsal vagus, their heart rates get very slow. But if you try to do the same thing to a dog or a cat, nothing happens. So there's an adaptation uh, with mammalian development in which these uh, areas of the brainstem that control the vagus move ventrally. And in the animals of, of predator animals, uh, they, those uh, neurons become linked with the face and, and uh, the, the head and the face, while in animals of prey, they still have some of that reptilian circuit in them. Mm. And I think that connects to the story you tell in the book about human beings' ability to demonstrate to others safety through you know, facial expression yeah. and, and voice and other co-regulatory mechanisms. Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, again, in the, in the world you're entering as a clinician, uh, the therapeutic presence or being present with a client is all about that, all about welcoming and making an understanding and reading the, literally reading the physiological state of your client from their voice and their face and their posture. Mm hmm. Well, Stephen, this has been a really illuminating conversation. I wonder if there's something I haven't asked you that you'd like to highlight. Well, no. First of all, I enjoyed it. And I, I think one thing you can think about, because you're very interested in IFS, and that is, do parts have their own physiological profile? Hmm. I mean, can you, in a sense, take IFS and look at it through the lens of polyvagal theory? And the answer is, yeah, you can do a pretty good job because lots of individuals have three parts. Okay, like they have a, a victim part, an aggressive part, and a more integrated part. Those are the basic circuits of the polyvagal theory. So when your body moves into these different states, those parts are what is really expressed. So it's in a sense, our parts are linked to the physiological state we're in, and we're not always in the same physiological state. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. Um, it's interesting to think that the parts have their own representation in our in our physical bodies, their own signatures in that way. Yeah. So a part that is angry and energetic and tries to break things, a part that withdraws and hunkers down, and a pro part that is really quite sociable. You know, you start seeing these things and you say, well, where did that come from? And you can start understanding that they're very much locked to access to different physiological states. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, something I'll have to think about some more. Yeah. Cool. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate the work you're doing and the and the book that you wrote. Where can people find you online or maybe seminars or things <clears throat> you're doing out in the world? Yeah, they could look look for me at the Polyvagal Institute dot org. It's Polyvagal Institute one word dot org. It's a not-for-profit organization we've created that really tries to uh, expand the impact of po principles of polyvagal theory, not only in mental health, but also in education and into society. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. And thank you for inviting me.